Hi, Alan Jeff. We're here today with Blake Potoff, the Executive Director of the Fairmont Opera House. Blake, the Opera House has been a long-standing entertainment venue and, and just you know, great programming that has existed here, but uh, we're, we're, we're facing a challenge now, aren't we? Yeah, we are. Yeah, obviously we can't be here, as you can see behind us. Uh, the Opera House is closed since October 2023 for, for construction work and renovations. Um, we've been fortunate enough to have some of our programming out in the community. Um, Cutting Edge Fitness here in town hosted Mick Sterling's Grand Ole Opry Christmas. Grace Lutheran Church uh, hosted Mankato Symphony Orchestra doing the Messiah around Christmas time. And then the Red Rock Center for the Arts also hosted La Dama, who was here for a week of outreach and education. And then this summer, uh, we had our K-2 and 3-6 Youth Theater at the First Congregational UCC Church downtown. And then we had our adult community theater performances of Mary Poppins at the Fairmont High School Performing Arts Center. So we've been out and about in the community, but yes, the challenge still here remains that we need to have the funds to repair the facility by the end of 2025 so that we can have all of that entertainment that we do so well back here in our facility. Absolutely. So you know, the great programming, great entertainment still going on, but obviously this is going on as well. Yeah. So let's dig into that a little bit. You know, from the outside, we drive by the Opera House, it looks the same, but for safety issues, uh, you, you, your board and yourself were, were forced to shut down the Opera House and the programming inside. So just tell us a little bit about what's going on and, and what needs to be addressed. Yeah, so all of this really started in 2017. So in 2017, we completed a historic structures report. It's a 300 page document that informs what we need to do to care for the facility as that's part of our mission. It's not just the program, but it's also caring for this historic building that we all love so much. So in 2017, we learned the prioritized list of things that we needed to do and address. And one of them was the exterior uh, entering and exiting. So we got new exterior doors, a new fire escape outside. Uh, and then the next priority that was listed was to examine further the roof. So we did a laser scan of the roof and learned that the trusses or the, the beams that hold up the, the roof. Major supports. The major supports. Um, those need some attention and help. And there's five of those that span the facility. Um, and so when we learned that, we learned that we also had to shore them up. So putting new scaffolding in to support the trusses is, was, was the next step. And that started then in October of 2023 when we closed down for exploratory demolition. So this has been a really long process that we knew we had to care for the facility. We knew there were things that we needed to do because it's a 123 year old facility. My running joke is if I was 123, I'd have some leaks and problems that I'd have to take care of as well. So exactly. It's the same thing with the building. So now we're diving into this roof project to fix the trusses. So all of the trusses will be wrapped in steel. The purlins, the battens, everything up in the roof will be wrapped in steel. So it's a 50 plus year fix. Then there will also be some of the masonry fixed. So three to four feet of the top of the facility will need to be opened so that the steel can be put in and brought into the facility. So that will have to be replaced and tuck pointed and then put all of the exploratory demolition, everything back to what it was. So in this project, there's no, this would be really cool. This would be really fun. This would be really exciting. Right. It's all just to get back open so that we can function again and put those performances on stage. Well, that's a big list, and 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 uh, I have a little experience with the Opera House. Yeah. I was actually on your board for a short mm -hmm. period of time, and and I know that uh, from a financial standpoint, the Opera House is is pretty sound, and and you've had uh, you've had some donations in the past, but this is bigger than that. It is. So in 2017, and actually in 2018, when we received it, uh, we received one of five million dollar checks from the Marlin Milbrandt estate. Part of that we put into our board long-term investments and then the other pieces of it we use to um, do the historic structures report and to invest in the facility and then we were shut down for the pandemic as well so that was our survival fund that kept us alive and even here talking about this today. Right. And that's currently what it's doing as well. So as of right now we've got about seven hundred thousand dollars in cash resources but this scaffolding that's here is costing us almost $11,000 per month, plus our regular operations, including maintaining the temperature in the facility, the utilities, gas, electric, all of that we're still paying out. So it, it costs us you know, $30,000 per month just to exist to get to that point of raising the money. So well, even if it, we had that million dollars, we'd still have to fundraise to get to four. You know, I was going to say $700,000 seems significant. It is. But yeah. the bigger ask is $4 million and... Um, how do you get there? <laughs> There's a lot of ways. It's a lot of work, and and really, it's 
it's consumed my work here and, and my life really. I'm sure. I'm it's, sure. It's incredible all the different places that you're looking and the people you talk to to try try to find the money. We worked with Representative Olson for bonding at the end of this year, which fell apart at the end of the session. Um, I've got applications in for congressionally directed spending through Senator Smith, Senator Klobuchar, and Representative Finstad's office at the federal level. Um, I have a spreadsheet of about 230 grant opportunities. That's all? Yeah, that's all. Uh, but unfortunately, we only qualify for a handful of them. So I'm finding out which ones are restricted by area, geography, whether it's programming or general operations. And um, and one of the big pieces that people ask about, well, have you looked for grants? What about federal grants for preservation? One of the big things to remember is that even though this building is on the National Historic Register, there's three tiers at the register. There's local, state, and national significance. For most of those federal level grants, you have to be state or national significance. The Opera House is only listed as local significance, so we don't qualify for many of those grants. Sure. So, those are a few of the places that we're looking and we're also doing local fundraising. We've got peer-to-peer -peer fundraisers going on. People have done uh, birthday fundraisers on Facebook. Uh, there's a Pampered Chef fundraiser going on right now where if you purchase Pampered Chef, then we get a portion of those proceeds. Um, we're doing a gala coming up in October at the Martin County Courthouse. We'll have invites that go out and, and invite people there to talk about pledging, to learn more about the project and then long-term investing into the facility as well. So it's really a multi-tiered approach. We've got all sorts of exciting things at year-end. Um, we'll do a year-end push because if you give us money by the year-end, we're a nonprofit, that goes sure. to your taxes for this year. So those are those big types of pushes that we're going for. Um, my goal is to have a million dollars in hand or pledged by the end of this calendar year and 80% of the project funded by July of next year. I think that's realistic. If we get some of the federal money coming through, get some state money, and then some local donors as well. Yeah, you know, and I think uh, you and I talked a little bit, and, and the question I had is, well, how can I, as just a, a local individual with an interest in the Opera House and wanting to support, uh, there's really no donation that's too small, is there? I mean, all the things you talked about, are, are, are great, but if I just want to write a check or, or drop off some cash, I can do that too. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, no no monetary donation is too small. If it's five dollars, if that's all that you have available to give, that's really helpful and important. It, because the more that we can show to some of these larger funders, whether it's individuals, corporations, or grant writers, or grant makers, excuse me, um, that the community is committed to this, they'll want to commit to it as well. So if it's five dollars, it's five hundred, if it's five thousand, that's great. If monetary donations aren't within your capabilities at this time, that's okay too. The number one thing that I need people in this community to do is ask questions. The more that you ask questions, the more that you can inform people within your network, whether it's sharing on Facebook, whether it's sharing at a family reunion or a class reunion that's coming up. You can talk to people about it at the holidays. When you ask those questions, then you actually learn what's going on and you don't need to assume. You don't need to glean from Facebook or from what you've heard or heard somebody else say, just come and ask me questions. That's the biggest thing because you know somebody who knows somebody who has more money than they know what to do with. I don't know them. So if we can broaden our network to make this more of a, a regional impactful project, then it's going to be easier to fundraise because I don't know everybody that you know. So just asking those questions, being well informed, and then spreading the word um, is a really, really helpful way to, to help us with this project, and it's really not that tough. And that really is the way things work in a small community. It's, it's, it's who you know and, and how, uh, how that word gets passed around and, and just awareness, general awareness. To, to your point, you don't know mm -hmm. who's going to be significant in, yep. in helping out. Um, what else would you like to talk about? You know, so it's it's easy and, and we're talking about the big need, but uh, talk about going forward. Talk about the Opera House over the next six months and, yeah. and uh, what's happening here. Yeah, so I touched on it a little bit already, but we'll do some year-end giving. Um, so there'll be a big push coming around Giving Tuesday in November. Um, we'll be participating in Give the Max Day, which is Raise Minnesota and Give MN's um, fundraising function. That'll be all online and social media, so you can donate there um, for Give MN. Uh, that those proceeds come right to us. People can do Facebook fundraisers for your birthday. Um, there's just so many ways that people can be involved in that. But really look for that year-end thing and consider how can I help now? You know, maybe there's people out there who have put the Opera House into their wills or have estate plans or something like that. We really want to honor that 
And the biggest thing for me is we want to honor your legacy, but I want you to be able to live your legacy. If you support us now financially and help us out with those gifts now, you can be here in these seats seeing the impact of that gift when we get to reopen. And that's a really powerful thing. It's not, I hope people remember me when I'm gone. I hope people recognize me while I'm still here. That's living a legacy, and I think that's something that we can do as an organization is to fulfill this, to bring us back to open, to do the programming that you talked about, and also help all of these people who want to leave this legacy live it while they're still here and see the performances and the productions of maybe it's their grandkids or their kids or their neighbors, see them performing on stage or see it through their eyes as they're sitting in these seats. You know, I've got a three-year-old daughter and the best thing that's ever happened to me is having her and having her here at the Opera House and having her be so excited about what she sees on this stage. It's exciting to me, but it's more exciting to see it through her eyes. You know, and that's the case for so many people in our community over the years, and, and uh, you know, that's still happening. It's not happening in this venue, but it's happening around our community. And, and uh, you know, as you look back here and you see the construction, and, and so many of us have been in the Opera House and enjoyed entertainment, and uh, it's a little bit heartbreaking to, uh, to see the state that it's in right now, but uh, we're moving forward in a positive direction. Yeah. and. This place isn't going anywhere. It's important to the community, and uh, you just uh, really commend you for your efforts. Good yeah. luck, um, and, and for all of us, help out any way you can. Whether that's yeah. spreading the good word, uh, throwing a check in the pot, or or just sharing some ideas. Yeah, yeah. I think the to your point of sitting in these seats, I, I've been using this metaphor throughout this entire time, and then that'll be it because I could keep you all day. Um, my family has a 1956 Ford F100. And we put new brakes on it, new tires, white wall tires, it had to be white wall. Right. And, and put money into the engine and all this stuff. The truck isn't worth that much in monetary value, right? But to me and my family, that's the closest thing I have to my grandfather. He's gone. And I remember bouncing up in that bench seat next to him, learning how to drive a three on the tree. Sure. Hearing choice words when you hit something or not. You know, you have those memories, right? And my daughter deserves to have that with my dad, her grandpa. And, and I want to have that connection to my family, that connection to the past, that's why we throw money at it, right? It's very similar here. There's gold plaques on every one of these seats that are from businesses and people, some of which don't exist and don't live anymore. And sometimes that's the closest we can get to our history. There's a plaque here that my uncle purchased. He died in 2020. We didn't even get to have a funeral for him, really. And now I can sit in that seat when we're back open and have that close connection with him and any one of these other community members that are here. Why is it important? Because this is just a vehicle for arts and culture and entertainment that connects us from the past to all those future generations, just like that truck does to my grandpa and my daughter. It's why it's important to save it. It's why it's important that people say, well, why would you throw money at that? Well, what kind of things do you throw money at that help carry on your family and your legacy and your memories? This place does it for 20,000 people a year for 120 plus years, like nowhere else can. There's a rich history and a rich legacy, and uh, let's keep it going, right? Absolutely. I'm not going to be the last executive director. It won't happen. We're, gonna, we're going to reopen. It will be difficult. We'll need everybody's help, but I, I won't be the last. Good. <laughs> Thanks, Blake. Absolutely. Thanks, Ned. Back to you, Jeff and Al.